Hi, good evening. Um, we are nearly on to half past seven, so I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes just to uh, let the uh, the last few uh, join us as we come through. So, so thanks everyone that's uh, here on time. I'm sure I'm like everybody, if there's any car noises that go past, it's because I've got the windows wide open. So, uh, but I'm sure uh, it will all be cool. Okay, well, I've got, uh, what, I've got 7.30, just about turned 7.31. So um, let's, uh, I think let's get uh, cracking and uh, we'll move through. Certainly, uh, I'll get through with the... Uh, the introductions. Okay, so welcome to the, the first Safeguarding Forum uh, they'll be hosting. And uh, thanks everyone for attending and your time this evening. Um, for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Peter Brook. I'm the Operations Manager and Lead Safeguarding Officer for uh, British Orienteering. I'm going to be running through the evening and taking questions where I can, and it'll be great to hear from you. Um, so do get involved as we go through. Um, we still we are using the, the GoToWebinar platform this evening. Uh, we might be using different ones in the future where we can have um, uh, breakout rooms as well. Um, but uh, for the first session, um, there's there's a, a quite a bit of information uh, as well to have a run through. But you can ask questions. So there is the question function. So um, on the there should be like a, probably a floating bar. Um, so on the generally on the, the right of your screen, which will have a little white arrow uh, in an orange box. If you click on that, it will open the, the question function. Uh, and then you'll be able to type a question in there. And uh, I'll be able to I've got that open in my screen in front of me. So I will try and get through uh, as many questions as they come in. Um, likewise, I'll also be able to unmute you as well. So if you want to ask a question verbally, um, I, I know some, some topics are far easier asking verbally. Um, if you just raise your hand, I will try and go through. Um, hopefully, I won't miss uh, anybody on the, the raising the hand, uh, but I'll unmute you and then uh, come to you. So uh, I'll be working my way uh, through that. Just uh, as a reminder early on as well, the session is being recorded. Uh, so please bear that in mind if you do ask any questions live. Um, and if you do wish to ask a question uh, or highlight any examples from your experience, if it, if it becomes relevant, then please, um, Ensure that you don't mention any names or other details that might identify the person, um, person's identity. Um, the purpose of the day today is obviously to help people manage um, safeguarding within your club, um, as opposed to discussing any specific certain cases. Um, so yeah, this this session will be available afterwards for everybody to view. Um, so that's uh, just a word of caution on that one. Uh, I can't promise I'll be able to answer every question. I'll get that. Uh, I'll mention that now. Um, but I'll be able to run through them in due course, and we'll be pick, picking up any Q and As um, uh, as we uh, <coughs> as as it comes through, uh, and as I get the answers to them. So if I need to clarify anything, um, I mentioned about the the question function. So um, well, certainly I am looking at the the hour. I have the clock in front of me as well. So. Um, we shall hopefully not be going over the uh, certainly over the hour. Um, obviously, we'll judge it how um, the questions come in. So, why why are we looking at holding a uh, forum? I'm sure you appreciate that that safeguarding is a crucial aspect in any sport. Uh, as a governing body, we're determined to ensure that we're prepared to deal with any incident or concern if and when it arises. Within our interior, we're very fortunate. That historically we've had very few concerns or incidents raised. However, we mustn't be ignorant to the fact that things um, that things have not happened, and we must ensure that the sport is as safe as possible for all. And I hope by holding these forums uh, for everybody that it'll help to support volunteers and clubs to keep safeguarding at the forefront of everyone's thoughts. I think there's been some really important changes that, um, and updates that have happened this year, which I'll be outlining uh, three of the key ones very shortly. Um, to help ensure that the sport does remain there as safe as possible. 
Um, you may be aware of the, the White Review um, published its interim findings in February uh, this year and is expected to conclude its review really shortly um, at the end of August um, with the full report which, uh, to follow, um, which will obviously have a, a big impact uh, across every uh, every sport and certainly I'm sure there will be uh, lessons that are learnt and uh, recommendations to come from it. So there's just a quick quick run through um, of, of what I'm going to be looking at uh, this evening. So areas will cover some safeguard, highlighting the safeguarding policies, uh, qualifications, checks, training, um, and dealing with a uh, concern. Uh, so first of all, key updates on the safeguarding policies. Um, the youth policy has been um, has been signed off. Um, it's created uh, good credit to uh, to Bird and Bird who helped uh, put that together. Um, so that can be found on the British Rowing Team website. The um, oops, if I just uh, get rid of that, that was floating up on the uh, on the link. Uh, the link on the slide. These slides will be available afterwards as well. Um, but that's where the uh, the documents can be found. There's lots of information on safeguarding um, and safety on the page. Uh, the adult policy is in its uh, final draft. It's just been uh, amended, um, just getting the numbers up to date and such through there. Um, that will then go over to the board and will be signed off. So in addition to the previous OSAFE policy, that has been split um, and is now uh, uh, two documents. Um, there have been some questions raised uh, about some areas that were in the previous OSAFE policy, which no longer feature. Um, so these will be appearing in other guidance documents uh, on the website in the future. Um, but if there is anything specific that you can't find, um, or I'd like to see a separate guidance document, do get in touch. Um, there is a, a lot of policy documents in, in the key documents uh, section of the website that we are working with uh, and working to develop. Also, a couple of key points uh, for clubs. So I've just put a couple of reminders on that slide as well. Um, for example, and it's just, just just good to check in. Um, I appreciate that there's uh, there's not been a lot of uh, attention such as these forums before. Um, so there's a lot of reminders when I spoke to other people, um, unsure about if they had these certain aspects in. So, but obviously, has your has the club got the active safeguarding policy? Um, many do adopt and will follow the British Orienteering policy. Um, uh, and it's providing a link on the website. So is that does it uh, does the website have a safeguarding section? If you put yourself in the position of uh, new members um, or other long established members, if they are looking for something in this line, are they able to um, easily find it? Um, I did a quick audit of um, uh, a couple of clubs um, today. Uh, it was pleasing to see that I could find the safeguarding section very easily and very quickly. Um, so that was really pleasing to see. Um, so the, from the, the, the handful that I, I had a quick uh, look through earlier. Um, but likewise as well, are members aware of the policy? Um, do they know what, do they know where to find it and what's included in it? Um, and the, another thing that did pop up was that because we have changed policies over, some of the links that are discovered were to the previous old policy as well. So there are some updates to make and I appreciate there's a lot that's gone on this year. Uh, not just around safeguarding, but likewise, um, it's just getting these uh, up to date. And I suppose the, the, the key one really there as well um, at the bottom I've just put on there is if somebody wishes to report a concern or an incident, would they know how to? Um, and where we're stripping everything back is trying, this is the aim of these sessions to support obviously yourselves, make it easier that if somebody doesn't know how to, then they'd be able to uh, to come to yourselves if you're a club welfare officer, um, or have confidence that they'll be able to go to any any member of the club, certainly the committees, to be able to um, report something. And committees would be anybody there would be confident enough to say, right, this is what we need to do. Now I appreciate that there's a lot on our part that we're um, trying to do as well, um, and we'll hopefully build more of these in as we move across. Uh, another big one that we had this year um, is the safeguarding qualification um, on a coach's license. So really important to, to highlight this one. So coaching qualification, uh, so safeguarding qualification is now a requirement uh, 
for a, a, license, a coach to be licensed. Um, that came into force at the beginning of June. Um, what was really pleasing to see was that while we had the period in March, uh, so in February and March, we had it was over 250 coaches took part in training, um, whether that was through the, the safeguarding courses that um, that we ran centrally from British Shore and Tyrion, or if you involved, were involved with the, uh, the, the courses with um, the Scottish Shore and Tyrion Association, um, it was really pleasing to see. Um, and some really, really good feedback that we had from the tutors about how everyone was really interacting. So it was very pleasing to uh, to see. Um, there are the breakdown of what coaches need. So if um, coaches isn't sure about the, how to become the license, it's on there. Um, and the exact the safeguard regulations, because obviously they are different if they are in Scotland, um, are listed on the link that we have on the slide. Um, so that's some different stuff so for England, Wales, Northern Ireland. The type of course you do, um, you take will depend on who you coach. So, for example, if someone coaches children, um, they must take an initial tutor-led training course, which is typically about three hours. Um, can be in person or online. Um, and if someone coaches adults, they need a minimum um, of an online course, um, of which there's a plug here for the British Orienteer and e-learning platform. We have an introduction to safeguarding on there. That would uh, count uh, as one of the online courses. Um, but I would highly recommend it for any members of the committee that was looking to, um, to learn a bit more about safeguarding. Um, and it's certainly related to all designed around orienteering. Um, I was really pleased with the people that, uh, that helped to test that as well. So even out of interest, I'd highly recommend that that would be something for, uh, for people to take. Um, details are on the link that uh, I've highlighted there, but showing to uh, with the e-learning courses. Uh, really easy to register, it can be done in your own time. Um, uh, an additional mention about uh, slight change, obviously there's a difference in Scotland, but uh, regardless of who you coach up in Scotland, you need to complete the Sport Scotland Child Welfare and Protection in Sport course. Uh, more information for that can be found on Scotland's uh, Scottish Orienteering Association um, website. Uh, DBS, uh, PPG and uh, Access NI. So certainly um, if you're looking at safe, safeguarding checks as well, um, there are different requirements uh, depending on which region you're in. Um, we have lots of um, all the information we've included on the, uh, the web page here, so the safeguarding checks, um, and that will have a breakdown depending on which region you are uh, in as to what you need. Um, steps for England, Wales, really very easy to follow and uh, you just need to complete an eligibility form uh, and send that either to myself or the info app mailbox uh, for British Orienteering. Uh, I'll be able to check it over and then make sure we, we assign you to the right DBS. Um, uh, it'll be an enhanced, whether it's uh, with or without uh, child bar and list check. I will run through um, a, a quick flow chart in a moment on that. Uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland, um, in, direct you to the again to the SOA uh, or NIOA websites for the most up-to-date information and links about how you move your uh, um, that across there are different processes like I say from where you live but the key thing to remind here and, and that I would urge people in and clubs to to uh, obviously pass on is that most coaches and support staff will need to have a check now um, there has been a slight change which I'll show you in a moment um, and that uh, so that message uh, I keep obviously trying to uh, to get across to people and uh, let people know. So this is the the flow chart. So again, this this is specifically for England, but just using this as an example. Um, so what previously happened um, and, and why there has been this change is that you'll see uh, from the top right hand box where it's uh, uh, does this happen more than three times a month. You see the arrow that underneath it that says no that previously went into this is not regulated activity and did not need a dbs check as you can see from the the diagram here that has now moved across into a check with uh, without a bad list check so hence there is a lot more people that should be getting a check um, and and purely for the obviously for the safety uh, of everyone involved i would urge everyone to make sure that they are completing them checks and the eligibility form will find out, will let us know. You put your details on there, we can then direct into the right one. Um, as for England and Wales, and we will direct, um, put you onto the, the, the right course, uh, the right uh, the right DBS. Um, 
but also um, what's just been happening over the last few days for a, a question uh, that, that came in last week we're aware of mappers within schools being asked uh, for a DBS um, we are working on that and we are being able to put in place so our online provider at the moment um, is putting in a basic level of check so that mappers will be able to get um, a basic it wouldn't be an enhanced um, but it would be a basic level of check which would hopefully help uh, address an issue if it comes in with schools um, so keep watching uh, this space we will uh, we'll have that shortly but that was as very much um, as what was coming in today okay i was slightly ahead of schedule on here which is uh which is good um uh, and if you'll say there are any questions do uh do get them in but what i just wanted to to have a look through and and i'd like to obviously to highlight the process if someone came to you to report safeguarding concern and, and this is where i think some of the questions will start uh will start popping up um but i'm conscious a lot of this will be common sense um and you may be familiar with this um but in addition you may not have been made aware of what to do previously so um this is all available in a short video so everything that i'm going to run through you'll see some of the images here i've taken actually from the video um however i do feel it's, it's useful as a reminder of what people can be doing um so do feel free if there's any points from experience you've had to uh, to come in with that as well Um, oh, just a question on the DBS that has come in. Uh, thank you, Sophie. So regarding coaches and support staff needing a DBS check, how does this apply to club volunteers who are helping out with the coaching session um, occasionally? Um, that will all again depend on, on how often you are working. So if I go back up to um, this previous slide, so if somebody is helping, uh, for example, more than three times a month, um, it is the regularity here so if it's a one-off session uh, and the supervised then we, we i would say that they will not be needing a dbs um as a one-off as long as certainly they're supervised and they are not taking a lead um but certainly if you do become more regular then they would need to have an enhanced without um child buying list check uh, another dbs question actually if you already have a dbs from another organization do you need one for orienteering from Jeanette? Um, no, uh, you don't need to get another one. You'll only need to get one if it, if the requirement for the orienteering DBS um, is more advanced than the existing DBS you have. So if you have a DBS without a barred list check, but you need one with, um, then you'd need to have another one with us. But if you've got one with um, an enhanced, um, with a barred list check, you will be okay. Um, we would just need to see that um, see a copy of that and it would need to be within three years as well so that would need to come to us um, and i will i will have a look through that so we need to see all the dbs um, and the valid date now the um uh, we've had a couple of um dbs's sent in previously where it's missed off the the date now obviously these people have then sent in the full one with with the date not cut off and um, it's been fine but it will only run from the date that your your course the certificate was issued there is no expiry date with dbs's that question does come in a few times however um we do want we require them to be done every three years to uh, to keep them current it's recommended that that's the the policy um through there um what is the British Orientation's advice on coaches working uh, alone with children? Is this okay as long as there is more than one child? And um, yes, what one-on-one -on -one just needs to be um, would have to have parents um, present. We do recommend that there is more. There is going to be the odd occasion, clearly, um, but we do need to be as uh, obviously as safe as uh, safe as possible. Um, and you've got to think back to putting yourself in that position if. Um, god forbid uh, an allegation was made against you um that was um that was false if you put yourself in a vulnerable position that then you are you are struggling uh, and there is a situation for an investigation to be to be made there so you've got to err on the side of caution there um does the safeguarding officer within clubs uh, so and uh, need a dbs 
Um, you'd only need a DBS if you meet this, this criteria uh, through there within, within your coaching. So uh, coaching or, or support, I keep talking about coaching, but it's also um, if you might be assisting uh, in an overnight trip for a squad um, or your club, um, certainly if you are taking some, um, uh, some people away on an overnight trip, um, and you'd be supervising in that capacity, you would need to um, uh, you would need to have a check. Um, uh, and is uh, a scanned copy of the DBS okay to send by email? Yes, we can have the the, stand, the scanned copies through. Okay, if any more DBS ones come through, I will um, we'll pick them up um, as a run uh, a bit later on. But uh, thanks for them questions that are coming through. Um, so looking at the responding of a, a safeguarding concern so any incident could come from someone who's been directly affected or or an individual who's witnessed or heard about an alleged concern um, we've certainly had things in the past where we, we've been told about um, something they've heard on the grapevine and then we've had to check um, we've had to check that up um, it's a responsible thing to do so if you do hear something we, we do ask that it gets uh, gets reported um, so regardless of who it's from, we all have that responsibility to uh, to follow things through. Lack of action now could lead to um, potential harm, further harm taking place in the future. Um, and we'd rather make a couple of inquiries and find out that there is nothing than um, ignore it and seriously affect uh, an individual um, or, or group of individuals in the future. So if someone does approach you, um, it can be a very nerve-wracking time, but what are the three there's three top tips um, that would recommend that you uh, that you follow show your care um, and, and help help them open up uh, it's giving your full attention to um, a child young person or an adult um, and talk about keeping your body language open uh, it's about being very relaxed being compassionate despite if somebody has taken the time to actually come through and actually give you the confidence in, in telling you something, it's it's about being understanding and reassuring them that their feelings are important. Phrases such as you've shown great courage today do help, um, despite what will be a very nerve wracking situation for, for yourselves if this was you. Clearly, it's going to be a lot more nerve wracking for the person that's coming to you as well. Second one about taking time and slowing down. There will be a lot of pauses. Um, so it's about respecting them and not interrupting the person who's who's trying to make a disclosure to you. It's talked about the confidence they've clearly got in you um, and how you exude that within your club um, is important. So uh, talk about the little things about websites to start with and making sure they're up to date. Um, and having a route for what people need to do. The more confidence that, that people have in seeing that, that clubs and members are all open um, and willing to hear will give more people the confidence should, should, should something come to you. Now, we're not talking strictly everything within orienteering. Something might, somebody might come to you with something that's happening outside of orienteering, but it, it's certainly, um, if we can help along there, we can then obviously pass that into the right, uh, right avenues and the authorities um, if we need to. So, it's not interrupting people. Talk about respecting pauses and, and let them go at their own pace. So recognizing and responding to their body language. And remember that it might take several conversations for, for them to share what might have happened to them. And then the third one on there about showing you understand and respecting back. Um, make it clear that you're interested in what a child is telling you. And reflect back on what they've said to check your understanding. Um, it's very important that we are double checking but not in a, a derogatory, derogatory way um, and using their language to show that uh, to show it's their experience so reflecting on on what they've told you and, and, and asking them questions back and on this one it's as it says, it's some, some, sometimes they are really obvious, but when you're in that situation, it's just a case of obviously taking in some reminders as well. So let the person revealing the concern know that they've done the right thing um, in coming forward. 
and it's clearly in, it's clearly uh, very important to explain that it's that the information that they provide will have to be shared with others so we're not trying to keep secrets um, uh, and keeping promises that you that you simply can't keep so when asking questions from your point of view it's keeping them to a minimum only asking them if you require clarification um, in what they're telling you and ensure that you don't probe for more information than is being offered um, it's not making as it says there negative comments or asking leading questions it's also important that you do not make negative comments about the alleged perpetrator um, or what's been happening um, or conduct your own investigation into the case. This is not your role and we don't want you to get into um, a, a vulnerable position um, where you're starting to make judgment on what one person has said. This is led, This is up to other people, uh, with professional people um, that will be trained up uh, and will be dealing with this. You're simply there to, to gather the facts and gather the initial um, inquiry and then we will take it off your hands uh, and move on through there. Um, just a, a quick point on this one that's been said, it must be hard to remember um, all that you've been told, should you take notes at the time? Certainly, if you've got the opportunity to take notes um, while it's being said, then yeah, essential, because there'll be so many things that, that will be coming um, coming through. Um, I'll talk about um, uh, just a bit about recording in a moment, but yes, yeah, certainly if you if you've got the opportunity to take notes at the time, then certainly do that. Um, somebody you could potentially record a conversation um, on your phone, but then that will open up other cans of worms um, as well because you then have to delete that very quickly and ensure that is deleted once you've made um, your notes um, or that have been sent further on. Um, in, in the future but it might also uh, you've got to consider somebody disclosing to you might perceive that um, as a negative way and then close up so it's, it's really important to make sure that it's one-on-one -on -one and, and ideally sort of paper notes if you're going to take notes um, uh, at this stage if you don't take notes at this stage it's then very important that when the conversation finished you write them down uh, as soon as possible because clearly everyone should be, be aware mine included memories fade very quickly um, and interpretations do and um, you don't want to be then interpreting where you are looking dealing with adults um, and children is slightly different so for adults it's got to be the adult that's leading um, and if they're happy to share information uh, happy for you sorry to share that information um, and then asking them, they will lead how they wish things to proceed. So it's giving the individual time is important. And for concerns regarding children, you need to be honest and reassuring clearly uh, and clearly explaining what you'll be doing next in terms of reporting what you've said. So you have a duty to report what the child um, has said. Looking through onto the um, no, so I just briefly mentioned this um, a moment ago. Recording the information, always record what you said in writing as soon as you can. Uh, as soon as you moved away from this conversation, you need to get as many points down um, that you can remember. Um, certainly the key ones um, that have been mentioned by that individual. You need to date and sign that information as well. What time, where, all this information will prove vital um, later on when we're trying to, when we the uh, authorities start investigating things, should it, it go to that level. Um, and don't dismiss any concern. So this is to, th this next one, The this flow chart is, is taken from, um, you might have seen it from the, the child safeguarding policy. Um, and uh, it shows the steps that, that we take when dealing with a concern or incident. Um, now, clearly, it, it might be a bit small on your screen, depending on how you're watching the session. Um, but I say it's in the policy. I'll be sending these slides out um, after the session as well. So uh, don't worry if you can't quite read it um, on here. Do, uh, do get hold of the policy. 
Um, and so it does outline how we deal with a, an incident or concern. Um, uh, the two snippets that I'm just about to read as well are taken directly from the policy as well. So um, it'll just give you an idea. So um, this section, this is from section uh, 6.3 um, in there, if you want to, uh, to have a look through as well. Um, in all cases of concerns raised, uh, reported to British Orienteering, British Orienteering will consider how best to respond to so all the concerns uh, that warrant or require referral to police and or local child protection teams will be referred, if not already uh, reported directly to the police and to the relevant local uh, uh, child protection team, who will be best placed to manage such cases. British Orienteer will then liaise with those authorities in relation to any action British Orienteer may propose to take into contact in the context of orienteering and support those authorities um, as may be necessary or appropriate. So we will um, we will often we will take everything and then it will come to myself as the lead safeguarding officer if a concern is raised and then I will analyse it um, and then more likely than not will convene the uh, the case management um, pursuant to case management group and then review and discuss the information. So the case management group um, is a group of individuals. Um, they're external to British Orienteering who come in um, and then they are they have experience across safeguarding and they will decide um, what they think is the best course of, uh, of uh, uh, to progress sorry best course of action that's the word I was looking for um, the the next section I was going to mention was 6.4 so if an individual has made a report about something in orienteering to the police and or local council child protection team but does not wish to report it to British Orienteering for any reason um, then British Orienteering should instead be, form, be informed on a no names basis that a report has been made uh, and to which force council it has been made. Um, British Orienteering can then liaise with the force council um, to determine whether any action by British Orienteering is appropriate. Um, clearly there may be instances um, where you don't wish to report the particular individual to us um, but that we need to know about the incident so that has to come through in a known names and then we can follow it up with the local authority um, and make sure that um, if it is somebody that is we, we've got the duty of care that if it's somebody operating within orienteering that, that shouldn't be that they could be off um, a, a temporary suspension order would be um, would be made if it is of such seriousness, depending on what information um, we were able to be to come across, um, to ensure the protection of people within sport. Um, but that is a decision that would have to uh, have to be made when we got that information. So I've got some questions. But so, uh, some questions have come in um, early as well, um, but I will put some. Uh, so I'll just go back here because I've got some um, some other uh, an example um, of a couple of things that have come in um, recently. So if you have got any particular questions on any cases um, or about case management, um, do let me uh, do let me know. So, for example, um, if a DBS has come back with something recorded on it um, depending on the offence um, as this could show anything from a minor driving offence to a more serious offence um, it'll be assessed by a safeguarding officer myself in the first instance um, and then possibly passed on to the case management group to consider um, so it'll be with with any case um, and they'd have a look through so some might be historic and um, depends whatever comes on that DBS um, uh, it might be that they require further investigation um, so somebody independent to then speak to people um, if they to speak to the individual um, it may be recommended that we do a risk assessment as well um, and that would conduct an interview um, with the person involved and just to run over the circumstances again completely confidential um, but it's a, a process that every sport will, will go through if um, issues are highlighted and we rightly got it um, to ensure that we are safe uh, safety conscious with our uh, with the sport and those individuals um, and I like to touch on so if we do become aware of um, an urgent and serious case and we'll convene the 
the uh, case management group um, or as quickly as we can uh, and potentially issue a, a temporary suspension um, order. They, again, don't happen very often, but will happen uh, if required, um, pending a full in investigation by uh, an independent person or the police. Um, some cases, in the series, the more serious cases, uh, it can take a while to conclude, um, but it's got to be um, managed in the right light, and the, the safety of all those uh, within the sport is the key priority. Uh, so just a, a quick uh, point that's come in just about notes. Yes, people probably have a um, notebook in the first aid kit. Good to use. It's very likely to be close at hand. Thanks, uh, uh, Jason, for that one. Yes, certainly. If there's, um, there's, there's obviously lots of kit that goes around um, to, to orienteering events, and that would be um, certainly really useful to have. Um, or jump on a map, use the back of a map or something certainly that um whatever does come to hand if it's an event uh, for example but uh, no some very uh, uh, good points there um so wendy if we need to report a concern uh should the concern be emailed or telephoned to british orienteering so there are on the safety adding and, and safety page there is um how to report a concern or how to report an incident two separate forms uh, and I advise that you use one of them two forms. Um, they have all the standard questions and um, boxes. Don't worry if there are boxes in there that you cannot fill uh, and complete. As much information on there as possible uh, is really beneficial um, and will help us to get started uh, through there. Um, alternatively, there are, you can, if it's very urgent uh, and you need to speak to somebody, there's, um, you can phone myself up um on the phone i will then ask you to put it in writing as well but by getting the phone call in early on i know something's coming and i can start um the process i know what to expect uh, coming through um and likewise if there is potentially to be a, a bigger issue then um, that, that might affect uh, the sport or a club on a wider basis i can then start to um, involve the most appropriate uh, people through there so it is um urgent that you get it through um, even if you've written all your notes on an email and send that to me then that's fine um, but I do advise and say the first two forms that we have on our safeguard and safety page um, are the best uh, best to use um, as your template uh, so I hope that um, I hope that helps um, so there's just a, a couple of questions that were sent in um, in advance um, so it'll be interesting here because there's a couple of questions that are asking about what other clubs um, have done as well. Um, so just before I get on to this, there was a question I was coming back to um, actually that, that came when I was talking about the concern, just on DBS. Um, so what if you have um, a, a registered with the DBS update service? Um, yeah, that's not a problem as well. We just need to get your, uh, your details and uh, permission to uh, to check that out so we just need an email to myself um uh, to the safeguarding uh, or info app uh, they'll all come to, to myself uh, to do the check anyway um, but i just need the certificate number your name and date of birth um, and your permission to be able to go in and check that um, so a lot of people obviously send them in for myself grab me permission i can quickly check on the the, uh, the system uh, and then I will update uh, your qualifications um, uh, and your records appropriately. Okay, so a couple of questions um, that, that came through. So I've been asked some uh, clarity for coaches and, and social media. Social media is clearly um, very good in some ways, very bad in another. Um, but so the uh, the, the Quoted the question that came through, quoted British Orienteering's advice to coaches. Um, coaches that are advised not uh, to follow athletes under the age of 18 or on Twitter, Instagram, similar sites um, as that. I, I'm sure there'll be some, if I put a list here, there'll be some that I would forget, some that I, uh, that, that everyone there, uh, seems to be a new one that pops up every week. Um, coaches should not have athletes under the age of 18 as their friends on social media networking sites um, when they have a permission, uh, position of trust. It may be very hard to not add um, other people that are adding you as friends, but it's certainly um, um, important that, uh, that that's, that's done. Um, 
so increasingly um all right so it's a Right, so I've just been so the the question that's coming has just been corrected uh, on this book. So increasingly, our juniors are you taken to using Strava and Zwift. Sorry, it's Swift, but um, I think that's auto correct when it's come across. But it's Zwift and similar. Uh, it's recognised that while these platforms are increasingly becoming similar to other social media platforms, they also do have potential for for coaches reviewing training, um, GPS, etc. Um, but it You've just got to put yourself in that that position um, of what potentially could happen. Do things get interpreted? We don't want you to be in a position where you you could have a an inner, you could assess something and then an innocent conversation could be taken the wrong way. Um, there's been lots of different examples so of coaches. Um, where things have been read the wrong way uh, and we don't want to, uh, obviously to put you in a, a vulnerable position so you've also then got to have um, different agreements really in place with somebody uh, the individual and the parents so if you're running a, an online training session um, for example obviously zoom has been um, been certainly one of the, the most kings over the um, over the last 18 months it's making sure that you, you're not in a position where you're one-on-one -on -one coaching online um, with somebody. It, it might sound very innocent, but then it will also, if you're on your own and you hear that the, a coach is coaching an individual, you're speaking to them online one-on-one, -on -one, then that's clearly, um, it, it doesn't, doesn't sound very safe, but it can be very safe if you have a uh, situation in mind. So if the child, if a parent is close by, uh, if a if there is agreement where the parent will sit in the same room as the child um, or there are other people on the call and it's not just a one-on-one -on -one call uh, but I do appreciate that there are some coaching where um, conversations will take place one-on-one -on -one, um, so it would always be advised to at least have their parent um, present again go back to the the potentials and vulnerability of, of a coach in that situation if something got uh, taken uh, differently um, but it was interesting to see if there's any other clubs have had any um, any experience about uh, this and their solutions of what they they've done. Um, I've not had any comments coming just yet, but uh, I'll move on to the next question. If there is anything that um, you think of um, that you've done of how you've managed this um, in a safe way, do uh, do let us know. Um, one here about do other clubs uh, British Orienteering and insist on membership. Uh, to take part in junior coaching so is there a requirement for this um you don't need to be a member of a club to take part in junior coaching um so because it, as long as a session is certainly registered as an activity as well you need to be registered to be covered um because you you could be running uh, different sessions uh, outdoor for different groups um, but it's the usual safeguarding um, procedures, regardless of, of who you are coaching, you should, you should be following um, on the day, uh, which I think links nicely into to this next uh, question that's come through. Um, so developed a recent coaching, um, so recent regular coaching uh, fitness session for our juniors, which has become increasingly uh, popular with the club, club juniors, bringing their friends along. Um, I think that's great. It's, it's you see more and more people coming in um, to the sport, word of mouth, friends, and it is always one of the best drivers of, of bringing people, uh, new people, into the sport. Um, but clearly, obviously, that that raises the other challenge of um, the collection of consent forms does become more onerous. Um, there are not they're not regular club juniors um, whose families we know. Um, and how are other clubs managing uh, to get consent? Does the info have to be have to travel to every training area? Um, are any clubs using sort of cloud based? I presume the cloud based is more looking at obviously the information uh, and the safety through there. Um, and what performer available um, with regard to medicals consent, social media consent. If you are taking pictures, so just on that, that social media, for example, if you are taking pictures of people you um, certainly uh, of juniors that you are using as part of your, your promotion or to show what's happening at events, don't forget you definitely need the parents' permission 
um, for that and that would include those that are, are not members uh, or have come along to try an event for the first time um, so if you have a, a permission form then make sure obviously that that is um, that you have that from the individuals that are that are attending um, the, the obvious the easier answer, answer to this is if you have a a form that somebody com that a parent completes um, as they are uh, dropping off beforehand with their information we need to know again the, the medical side of things if somebody is is out training depending on what sort of onerous whether it's um, in a sports or if you're doing anything physical um, any physical training or if you're doing um, less physical and, and doing map skills and such and, and doing courses it's important that um, those leading the sessions are aware of potential challenges, um, potential injuries, health concerns of that individual. Um, so all, everybody's got to be treated the same. So you'd certainly expect if you've got a club junior in there, um, you'd know their information, you'd have that from the parents. But we do, we do need that uh, and that consent from those that are, uh, that are coming uh, along as well. So yeah, come back to reflecting, put yourself into a position if something happened um, to that individual that came along and you didn't have any contact details for them um, or they had a condition that that you should have known about um, or, or could have known about before they did um, any particular um, physical activity um, that was strenuous um, do we just need to be you need to be safe uh, and conscious on that So um, it's uh, quarter past eight at the moment, um, and that was so a couple of questions that had come in before. So thanks for uh, the questions that that, that came in uh, on that. Um, what the if I will now give I haven't got any more questions on here um, that, that have come through. So if there are any questions that you're thinking about um, at the moment, do uh, add them into the the question box or put your hand up and um, I'll. Uh, unmute you to uh, to ask that question. The intention of what the plans are for these uh, for the forms going forward, as I tapped on um, and, and mentioned earlier, that we'll be hoping to do more. Uh, well, there'll be certainly several uh, these that'll be running it, um, every year, um, and then we'll be looking at doing interaction groups about how to deal with uh, deal with different concerns, different scenarios. Um, this session was certainly a more certainly an introduction and understanding about. Um, what um, uh, what the updates have been this year because there has certainly been a lot um, and then we'll be we'll be working uh, through that and certainly bringing in other people um, uh, club welfare officers uh, and others from other agencies to come in and just explain more about what their roles are and what they do um, so there is a role that uh, you may or may not be familiar with um, called the ladder which is a local um, authority officer there who deals with um, yeah, all, all the situations when they come in so we'll get different people in to, to chat through um, which would be really really insightful to understand the different processes so this was very much so this very much as a, a starting um, a starting session uh, so a couple of questions that have uh, come in so I'll start from the top um, where will the slides um, be able to uh, be to access in the future. So I'll put the be putting um, safeguarding forums web page. I'll be putting that together. Uh, that'll be available in the next couple of days. Um, everybody that's been on the the session this evening will uh, get an automatic recording of this through anyway. Um, but I will put the uh, the slides on. Um, I will also send the the slides out via email. I'm saying that consciously because I'm just thinking with the photos on, they might be. Uh, uh, it might be rather large, but um, I should certainly get it probably as a PDF and get them out as well in that. Um, but certainly uh, they'll, they'll be available as, as PowerPoint online shortly on the safeguarding pages. Um, with regards to DBS update service, can these be used for any coaches whose DBS checks are three years old? Um, so we can use it because it's it's the DBS update service does keep uh, keep it current. So. Uh, yeah, we can we can run the checks. Just send us um, send us the details which I outlined earlier, and I'll be able to to check through there. Um, and 
So, um, uh, Julia, thank you uh, for the question that's come in. So, saying that you've uh, done the int online introduction to safeguarding the thought it had some uh, had valuable points. Uh, can you access it for your gain, gain the, or, or get the script? I shall um, speak to my colleague, Howard Blackman. He's been uh, instrumental in pulling that together. Um, uh, at our side, he's pulled all the, the different e-learning courses that uh, have launched from September. So, um, a completely intentional plug here with the, the secondary school, the primary school courses that are on there, um, the event safety um, as well, and certainly the safeguarding that's on there. Uh, but I will we'll speak to Howard and um, see what uh, see what we can do for you on there. Um, it is good to to mention that we've not we've also had on the learning from that the now the, the there was a bit of um, a bit of a delay with with the API which allows the uh, allows the e-learning module to talk to our database. That's now all been set up. So when you complete that, it should automatically set uh, update your qualifications um as well so it doesn't need you to tell us that you've done it or us to go into records to find out who's done it so should all start happening seamlessly um but if you have done that course for example um prior to it only happened recently there were some delays that were out of our control um if it isn't it hasn't appeared on there do let us know and we can get that corrected um everyone should be updated on there now um but like I said, there's always might be the odd one or two that would uh, that might fall through the cracks on that but uh, hopefully we can uh, we can iron that out um just sort of another one on on dbs um the length of time a dbs takes to come through can vary um we've had a couple um, only a couple that have taken um about a week a week and a half to come through uh, i think the quickest dbs that came through was about 12 hours uh, we did the verification on the afternoon by the following morning it come through um some generally will take a few days so um i'd certainly urge people with with trips that look like they're, they're coming up as well um to get them done well in advance just to avoid any potential difficulties um but certainly um i've not experienced any that have gone over the two weeks at the moment but there's always the first time so I would advise people get them done uh, as soon as possible. Okay, uh, I think there's the, the questions have slowed down and uh, stopped. I think let me just roll this uh, down on my screen. Yeah. Um, yep. Quick refresh has, has slowed them down on that has stopped. So. Um, I would just like to thank you for the tents this evening. Um, I hope it was useful. Um, I said the information will be going on online again soon um, and shortly. But uh, if you do have any questions, do um, do send them to me, whether they're confidential or you just want some more clarity. Um, I said I've been in position. Uh, I started in January, so I'm still picking up a few different bits. Um, in certainly in this role in January, uh, I'm still picking up. Uh, lots of different areas so if there's a question I can't answer I will certainly uh, come back to you but uh, thanks for this evening and um, I will speak soon